The views and opinions expressed on America's Workforce Union podcast and its digital media channels are solely those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the producers or sponsors. Welcome to the America's Workforce Radio Podcast, the flagship production of the American Workers Radio and Podcast Network, where organized labor and its never-ending fight to protect the rights of the American worker come first. Now, presented by LIUNA, Laborers International Union of North America, here's your host, Ed Flash Ferrens. What a pro-union governor can do for workers. Illinois takes the teeth out of captive audience meetings and, at the same time, strengthens child labor laws. Today on the show, the Columbus Central Ohio Building Trades, and it's our first Friday with Fred, Fred Redman, Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO. Welcome to the Friday, August 2nd edition of America's Workforce, where we're available on at least five platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. Mr. Dorsey Hager will be our first guest on the show today. Dorsey serves as Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council, columbusconstruction.org, and you can follow them on X at Build Central OH. Every time we talk to Dorsey, something new is popping up in Central Ohio. We'll get an update on the Intel plant. We'll talk about some undocumented workers that are causing a problem in Central Ohio. They're doing a lot of uh, outreach at the Ohio State Fair, as you know. We need more in the building trades because of what's going on in central Ohio and so much is going on. In fact, I remember talking to Dorsey in the last segment or the one before. They expect the population to more or less triple in the next 25 years because of all the construction, all the building that's going on in central Ohio. And we're going to talk about politics. As you know, we got a big election coming up in a couple of months, and uh, Dorsey sent me an article that came out a couple of months ago in the New Yorker about Joe Biden being the most pro-labor president since FDR. A lot of union folks have said pretty much the same thing, and we were all gearing up for a Joe Biden re-election. That has all changed with Kamala Harris, and we'll get uh, Dorsey's thoughts on that as well. Fred Redman will be joining us as our second guest on the show. Fred, of course, Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO, longtime steel worker. And uh, right away after Joe Biden bowed out of the race, they endorsed the AFL-CIO Executive Council unanimously endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris for president in the 2024 election. Liz Schuler's commented as saying, from day one, Kamala Harris has been a true partner in leading the most pro-labor administration in history. At every step in her distinguished career in public office, she's proven herself a principled and tenacious fighter for working people and a visionary leader that we can count on. From taking on Wall Street and corporate greed to leading efforts to expand affordable child care and support vulnerable workers, she's shown time and time again that she is on our side. And Fred's going to run down a couple examples of how she has helped workers and how pro-union. In fact, she was, uh, I think it was last week at the uh, American Federation of Teachers Convention. She got a rousing reception there. And the UAW, by the way, endorsed her this week. So uh, Fred Redman will be our second guest right here on America's Workforce. And now a brief look into the world of labor. This segment brought to you by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, offering fixed income, real estate, and equity investment options to clients from coast to coast. You can find more at boydwatterson.com. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker has signed the Worker Freedom of Speech Act into law, which, by the way, prohibits employers from disciplining, penalizing, or retaliating against workers who choose not to take part in captive audience meetings. If the meeting is designed to communicate an employer's position on religious or political matters in targeting employers' anti-union captive audience meetings, the bill defines political matters as including 
union-related matters. How about that? Where a worker is compelled to attend such a meeting or penalized for not attending, the aggrieved worker has a year to file a civil lawsuit in which the relief includes compensation and reinstatement of employment. Complaints can also be filed with the state's Labor Department for public enforcement and civil penalties on top of that. This is amazing. Now, this law is not in effect. It will go into effect on January 1 in 2025. And with that being said, Illinois will become the eighth state, number eight, to prohibit employers from punishing workers for opting out of religious or political meetings, including meetings on unionization efforts. Congratulations there to, uh, I know the uh, Illinois AFL-CIO worked hard on that, but the governor went in the right direction. And I want to add to that, he signed into law Senate Bill 3646, which is called the Child Labor Law of 2024. This legislation updates child labor regulations to the 21st century by repealing the existing statute and replacing it with a modern framework. And this is what the governor said. While neighboring states weaken their child labor laws, in Illinois, we're modernizing our regulatory framework to further protect minors from unscrupulous employers. Minors should be able to experience safe, age-appropriate work in an educational setting, and I'm proud of the added protections my administration and the General Assembly advanced through this bill. SB 3646 is intended to provide a structure for minors to engage in safe, age-appropriate work while protecting their health and access to education. The bill sets standards for working conditions for children age 15 and younger, including limiting hours of work and updating the list of jobs that minors cannot hold. If it's a dangerous job, they're not going to do it. And it's got some teeth. SB 3646 also includes the Illinois Department of Labor with new tools to enforce the law and protect youth workers. To deter egregious violations, the bill updates penalty amounts and adds a multiplier in cases of a minor's death, injury, or illness. On top of that, employers will now be required to report to the minor's school if they are injured or killed at work. It's amazing. When you got good people in office... Good things happen for workers. Amen to that. Time now for another segment of Labor 130. This is a special feature presented by Blue Cross and Blue Shields National Labor Office to promote the fact that we are coming up to the 130th anniversary of Labor Day. That's right. So what we're doing, we're using this time to highlight the people and the unions that got us where we are today. And if there is one event that I make sure we talk about every year on or around March 25th. It's the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in 1911 when 146 young women, immigrants, garment workers, died in New York City, many jumping to their deaths because the exit doors were locked. And the building owner said he locked them because he didn't want them to keep going to the bathroom. It's an amazing story, and there's so much posted on what happened on March 25th, 1911. Well, Mary Ann Trashati is president of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition, and she talked to us about how that day led to a tireless fight to advance workers' rights and safety on the job. The triangle is important to working people then, uh, was important to my mom, and it's important to me. Um, and as you said, it, it contributed to the career of Frances Perkins. She saw the fire that day and was so moved by what she saw, so horrified that she basically dedicated the rest of her life to advocating for workers, including pushing for things in the New Deal, protections that are threatened today. Uh, the National Labor Relations Board, for example, is threatened by a lawsuit, um, Social Security. 
uh, is constantly threatened. Um, but those things are all outgrowths of the fire, um, believe it or not. Uh, things like workers' comp um, and Social Security and the uh, eradication of exploitative child labor, which, alas, is also making a comeback. All of those things really uh, grew out of the fire and uh, people's experiences of seeing this terrible terrible thing. Uh, you know, women, some of them as young as 14, dying, uh, at least 60 of them jumping out the windows of the factory because the doors were locked, preventing them from getting out. Um, so it really, it, it left its mark um, on workers too, I should add. Uh, government uh, leaders, of course, stepped up. They, they uh, felt pressured to do so, but so did working people. They organized, they agitated, uh, they refused uh, to allow themselves to be uh, put into these situations. Uh, so, you know, they fought back by striking and organizing unions. And I think we're seeing that today, too. So mm -hmm. the spirit of Triangle lives on. It certainly was a horrific day in our history and one where 146 lives paved the way for a much safer environment for all workers today. The Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. This segment, by the way, is brought to you by Blue Cross and Blue Shield's National Labor Office. Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies formed out of a need to provide affordable health care to teachers, to loggers, and miners. And in 1965, the Blues developed the National Labor Office to strengthen its commitment to organized labor. Today, Blue Cross and Blue Shield's National Labor Office remains focused on America's workers, advocating for affordable and equitable health care. Partnering with strategic alliances to provide industry-leading products and services and proudly serving more than 18 million unionized workers, retirees, and their families. All working hard for America's working families, for the health of America. You can learn more by following them at Blue Labor on LinkedIn and X, formerly known as Twitter. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Dorsey Hager on behalf of the Columbus Central Ohio Building Trades. This is America's Workforce. It takes Layuna to keep America running. Over 70,000 public employees are part of Layuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, delivering critical services such as health care and emergency response, as well as maintaining roads and sanitation systems. Even the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, representing over 47,000 U.S. postal workers, is affiliated with Layuna. Find out what it takes for Liuna to keep America running at liuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the United Steelworkers. You can find more at usw.org. Are you looking for a new health care partner for your union members? Let Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield be your champion, making sure your members live their healthiest lives now more than ever. It's important to have a partner you can trust, one who understands the unique challenges unions face. Anthem provides a variety of options to meet your organization's needs and helps you control costs without sacrificing quality of care. For more information, visit anthem.com slash labor and trust. This segment of the show is brought to you by the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. We're the nurses, firefighters, and claims representatives that help keep our government services running. We respond to natural disasters. We care for our nation's veterans. And we investigate discrimination in the workplace. We are federal and D.C. government workers. And we are proud to serve the American people. Working in more than 70 agencies across the government, we know we can fulfill our mission because our union has our back. Learn more at AFGE. Dot org. Paid for by the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, where you can find more at teamster.org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Ironworkers. You can find more at ironworkers.org. Now, back to America's Workforce. Here's Ed Flash Ferens. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast, AWF Union Podcast. By the way, this next segment brought to you in part by the Ohio Federation of Teachers, oh.aft.org is their website. Let's go to Central Ohio and join one of our longtime regulars, Dorsey Hager, Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council. 
an appropriate Twitter handle or X handle, Build Central OH. And we always start off these segments with something new that's popping up in Central Ohio. Dorsey Hager, welcome back to the show. How you doing, my brother? Because I know there's a whole lot going on in Central Ohio. Let's start right there. Go ahead. Yeah, so the Honda plant in Fayette County keeps trudging along. We're doing great down there. It's over 2,000 craft workers on there as we uh, try to meet that schedule for Honda and LG to be producing batteries by January 9th of 2025. Intel obviously continues to ramp up. There's uh, about 1,600 tradespeople there. They want to be at 2,500 by year's end, and then we hope to be to the 5,000 mark next year. So that's great out there at Intel. They're pouring a ton of concrete. Uh, They're starting to put in steel and starting to go vertical. Obviously, the infrastructure around the plant, the roads, the bridges, uh, you know, to be able to accept these super loads that are coming off the barges up the Ohio River and then are trucking up 23 from Portsmouth and going out there. Uh, they're getting ready to install uh, a super crane out there to help with, uh, I mean, there's 22 cranes on site now, but they're getting ready to install and build a super crane out there to help with the building of the fabs and some of the heavy equipment and stuff. So everything's exciting. There's more announcements, you know, uh, Google's investing another two and a half billion into their three campuses, New Albany, Lancaster, and South Columbus, which is going to be a lot of great, great data center work, but also support building work for our tradespeople. Um, we're getting close to another major announcement by Amazon, which is great. They're looking to extend their footprint here in central Ohio. And, uh, we're hearing rumors of other projects in Fayette County down there where the Honda LG plan is. So I think that'll be the next, you know, Licking County beach road, that area with Facebook and Google and Microsoft and Intel has exploded, but I think Fayette County is going to be the next area in our territory that really grows and 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 uh, and experiences a lot of uh, construction as well. So it's exciting times. All the guys here, all the training directors, the organizers, the reps, they're pitching in. They're doing what they need to do to make sure we get out, secure manpower, grow our apprenticeship programs, organize people who are uh, being taken advantage of in the market who aren't making the wages and benefits that they should be. And we're just growing our ranks to make sure we take care of all this work. You uh, had a presence at the Ohio State Fair, and I know you did some outreach, a lot of traffic there. Um, how did How's that turning out for you, by the way? Yeah, so we partner, the Columbus Building Trades partners with the Ohio State Building Trades and the Cement Masons Union. Cement Masons have had a footprint, the Ohio State fair for quite a while where they do a lot of their competitions they do a lot of jtc stuff concrete finishing plastering and stuff and it's really really cool and attracts a lot of people attracts a lot of crowds so we've been there doing outreach with them we always do the first wednesday thursday friday of the first week the governor came through lieutenant governor john houston came through uh representative mark johnson came through and then thursday we were able to host a large uh contingent of uh senior management folks from Bechtel, who's the main contractor that's building uh, the chips plant out there at Intel, along with their CEO, Brendan Bechtel. So it was great to see them come through and see what the trades are doing, not only to get all, be able to get talent and grow their apprenticeship programs, but also what we're doing in the market to get people of color, uh, females, vets, which is very important to Bechtel and very important to us too, as we continue to diversify the building trades and uh, make fair representation of the communities that we live and work in. But it was tremendous opportunity. It was great to see all the people. It was great to see all our folks out there, all the hands-on demonstrations, see a lot of kids, a lot of teens, even some young adults, maybe looking for a second career or deviating from what they're doing now to come out and, uh, you know, talk to the sprinkler fitters, the insulators, the pipe fitters, sheet metal, bricklayers, cement, just all of them. And then uh, it was a great time, great opportunity, a little hot. First week at the Ohio State Fair is always hot and humid, but it was well worth it. Good, good to hear. But Well, you need all those workers. Here's what concerns me, and I've been thinking about this since the last time you and I talked And that is the growth of the population in central Ohio, which you told us here on America's workforce is probably going to triple in the next 25 years. And you're right around, what is it, 900,000 in the uh, Columbus metro area. And uh, I remember you saying it's probably going to grow to about 3 million. I have to ask you, 
That means a change in the infrastructure. That means more roads, more communication workers. I mean, building, <laughs> I mean, you're doing the commercial part right now. Residential is going to pick up. I mean, everything's going to explode right now. How are they addressing this situation? Because 25 years, Dorsey, you know this, it's not that far away. No, it's not that far away, especially when you start laying, like you said, the plans and infrastructure for roads and bridges uh, to take care of the increased population. I mean, every sector of the Columbus and Central Ohio market, whether it's the north side of Columbus and Route 23 that extends all the way up to Toledo or the south side where the Google campus has a huge presence or the east side in the eastern part of Franklin County, western part of Licking County, where you have all the data centers and you have Intel and Google and everything or even the west side where you're starting to see some data center expansion, they're all experiencing tremendous growth, not only homes, but also apartments, condominiums, and complexes. And the city of Columbus itself is starting to grow up, not so much more out, which is good, and the population is becoming more dense. So we're looking at things, uh, mass transit. You know, We're going to talk about Link Us as we get closer to the election year, which is an $8 billion investment in partnership with the city and the county and also CODA, the Central Ohio Transit Authority, uh, to have mass transit and rapid transit to be able to get people from the west side to the east side in a matter of minutes or vice versa. Um, because we got to get a lot of these cars off the roads. We got to help folks who maybe don't have transportation that they need. And we've got to get people from the underserved communities, the Franklins and the Lindens, uh, the South Parsons to these job centers where a lot of these projects are going on and a lot of these manufacturing, but also these jobs are going to be created uh, to make sure that we can get the workforce there to where they're needed. So we talk about it every day. You know, like I said, not only roads and bridges, but houses, uh, light commercial mixed use commercial with uh, with uh, apartments and condos and residential. And then also, you know, the churches, the schools, you know, all the school systems are busting. A lot of our school systems have levies on the ballot for this fall. A lot of them are going to be building new buildings as their population grows and their student enrollment grows. Um, so, yeah, it's all very interesting, but it's exciting times here in Columbus. And I know that we're all embracing it and looking forward to the change that's about ready to occur. You talked about uh, underserved, those in underserved communities. And I know the building trades, not just in Columbus, but nationally, they're reaching out to people of color. And again, it's the line I always use. And I got that from you. Thank you very much. The pathway to the middle class. How are we doing? You mentioned the, the outreach you did at the Ohio State Fair. And you do a lot. I mean, you're you're you are a machine down there trying to get more people because you need them. How are we doing? Are we making a dent in that uh, in that population? I think we definitely are. I think the biggest thing that we've accomplished is we've raised awareness in communities that have been underserved here in Franklin County and Columbus in the past, and we've letting we've let folks know that these opportunities in the building trades are there. They're growing. And they're going to be here for a long time. And I think that you're seeing parents now that come to career fairs and they want to hear about these opportunities in the trades for their son or their daughter, uh, you know, to get into the plumbers and pipe fitters apprenticeship, the IBW apprenticeship, the iron workers apprenticeship to where after, you know, three or four years they can graduate and, uh, and be earning a six figure income with a great benefit package and no debt. And I think that we're doing a great job educating those folks in the public. I know that Kitty French at the Ohio State Building Trades is doing a lot with the schools and the teachers and the guidance counselors to let them know of these opportunities. And we're also doing a great job of getting out into the middle schools, but also getting out into the high schools and talking to freshmen and sophomores so they can make educated choices as well when it comes to their maths and sciences uh, to prepare them to be able to step right into the trades once they get out of high school, if they don't want to go to college or maybe they can't afford to go to college. So it's all good stuff. We're all pitching in. We're doing the best we can. But yeah, I think we're doing a great job of raising awareness. And, you know, the best folks to speak about it are the folks that have graduated from our apprenticeship programs and from our pre-apprenticeship programs that take those those stories and 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 go back to their neighborhoods and they tell their neighbors, they tell their their nieces, their nephews, their cousins, and and it, and it really spreads and it, and it really creates a lot of excitement to get a lot of those folks to come out and partake in these opportunities that we're offering. Well, you just got to maintain it and grow it, and it seems to be going in the right direction, so that's certainly good to hear. 
Dorsey Hager, Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council, columbusconstruction.org. More to come. We have to talk about some undocumented workers and also getting ready for the big election. Later in the show, it's our first Friday with Fred, Fred Redman, Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO. Back in a few minutes. Don't go away. You're listening to America's Workforce with Ed Flash Ferens. It takes Lyuna to power North America with affordable energy. The men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, have the skills needed to build and maintain oil, natural gas, nuclear, solar, and wind projects that are shaping America's energy future. From new energy tech to retrofitted facilities, Lyuna members do it all. Find out what it takes to be powered by Lyuna at Lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. You can find more at ifpte.org. The Iron Workers Great Lakes District Council, consisting of eight iron worker local unions in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan. We build the skylines and bridges along the Great Lakes. With more work than ever before, the Great Lakes District Council is actively searching out the next great iron worker. Whether it's building the next Intel plant or constructing a bridge to safely connect our great cities along the lake. So join the Iron Workers Great Lakes District Council today. Find out how and learn more about the council by visiting IWDistrictCouncil.com. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Communication Workers of America. You can find more at CWA-Union.org. There is unity and strength for workers. We are the USW. We are the USW. The The United United Steel Workers. The largest industrial union in North America. We represent 850,000 members in In the the US, US, Canada, Canada, and and the the Caribbean. Caribbean. We work in metals, rubber, chemicals, paper, oil refining, atomic energy, and the service sector. We are steel workers, standing strong and fighting for what's right. This segment of the show is brought to you by the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. For more information, please visit bmwe.org. Now, back to Ed Flash Ferens with America's Workforce. And remember, you can check us out on at least five platforms. That includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. And when you get an opportunity, here's what you do. Just sign up, receive our shows on a regular basis, and give us a rating. We always appreciate those five-star ratings, so please keep them coming. By the way, if you miss a show, just check out awfpodcast.com. We had a really good conversation with uh, Tony Cardwell yesterday. All the conversations we have are pretty riveting, but this one really, he hit it out of the park and he gave us a lot of information about what's happening in California and also the Railroad Safety Enhancement Act, which is a better piece of legislation in the House than uh, what's being considered in the Senate right now. And speaking of which, we talked on uh, what happened in East Palestine, Ohio, and that's why that legislation is happening. It takes an accident for good legislation to happen, sadly. But uh, those of you listening in Toledo just want to call attention to uh, what's going to happen tomorrow starting at 9.30 at the Kent Branch Library on Collingswood Boulevard. And I got a um, press release from uh, a dear friend who's been on the show, Chris Albright. He's a labor brother, Lyuna Local 58. He got sick in East Palestine. And he lost his job. He's getting better. Talked to him the other day, and he said he might be uh, getting back to work. So things are going in the right direction. But I'll tell you, the train, that Norfolk Southern Railroad train that derailed, actually passed through Toledo. And it could have derailed in Toledo. So now the folks in Toledo are saying, hey, wait a minute, let's talk about this. And that's why they're having this conference tomorrow. Again, this is uh, tomorrow, August 3rd, Kent Branch Library. 3101 Collingswood Boulevard in Toledo. It's a Justice for East Palestine Coalition. In fact, they're planning a national rally in Washington in October. All right, let's go back to our live line. Rejoin Dorsey Hager on behalf of the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council. So what's going on with these undocumented workers 
in uh, in Central. You got all this building going on, and all of a sudden, I'm sure there's some you know unscrupulous. I love that word, unscrupulous employers bringing in undocumented workers to do some of the work. What's going on here, Dorsey? Yeah, so. Obviously, this story is pretty new, pretty fresh. Lots of details are coming out. But basically, uh, last week, the Department of Homeland Security served search warrants on 27 different businesses in Montgomery County, Greater Dayton area, uh, Moraine, Miamisburg, and that area. And there was, like I said, 27 businesses that they served warrants on that were not only working, but some of these businesses were also housing on site undocumented workers. And uh, the focus of the investigation seems to be on a third uh, party, like a labor company that that, uh, sends out labor to these businesses, like a referral uh, service, I guess you would say. And obviously this company and this group does not use E-Verify. They don't check on backgrounds. They don't check for any documentation or anything like that. And they've sent out a lot of undocumented workers to these businesses. But the the one that caught my eye was a glass manufacturer that's Chinese owned. Uh, the state of Ohio, Jobs Ohio, gave about $7 million in incentives when they um, recon their plant back in 2015 in Moraine. And it was an old General Motors plant Uh, That had been shut down, I believe, in 2009. And a company out of China called Fu Yao came in, bought the plant, reconfigured it to make glass, which they're a supplier for GM. And Fu Yao was one of the ones that had a lot of these undocumented workers not only working there on site, but they were also staying there, too, at the factory. And a lot of people may remember Fu Yao, the Chinese glass manufacturer, Uh, from the 2019 documentary, American Factory. And uh, it was a great documentary. If anybody hasn't seen it uh, that's listening, uh, you need to check it out. You can still view it on Netflix. Former President Obama and his wife, uh, Michelle, were part of the executive producers because they saw the story and believed in it so much. And they helped get the documentary made. But um, it follows uh, the transformation of the plant. It shows the workers trying to unionize. Because obviously uh, uh, some of the safety standards were not what they were for a lot of those people who worked in that plant for General Motors. The wagers and benefits were nowhere comparable. You basically had folks making $27 to $28 an hour with a great benefit package as GM workers. They're now working for Fu Yao, awful benefits, and making around $15.90 an hour. And like I said, they tried to organize, and you know, Fu Yao did the anti-organizing playbook. They brought in lawyers. They, you know, brainwashed all of the employees uh, during breaks, lunches, even took them off the assembly line floor and brought them in for mandatory training to explain to them how bad the UAW was and how bad it was to join a union. Uh, they immediately gave every employee a $1 an hour raise. It was a close vote, but the union lost and they were unable to organize Fu Yao. So I just thought that that was pretty interesting. It caught my mind when I saw that, uh, you know, and uh, decided to share it with your listeners. But we're going to stay on top of it, see what happens as well out there, but also find out who else that this company is providing these undocumented workers to. So it's going to be really interesting to stay on top of it. But I'm glad Homeland Security is doing what they're doing to uh, to expose this. And hopefully they're going to prosecute this company and these companies that are using these people to the fullest extent of the law. And I think some of our politicians learned a lesson on what happened there. Because when they lured them in, you know there were tax incentives to bring them in here. And now if they would have put certain conditions, you know, labor conditions in there, that wouldn't be the case. They wouldn't be making a movie about what happened there because those workers are being screwed. But and they're doing and much credit to the Biden administration, especially in the bipartisan Infrastructure and Jobs Act. They put those labor protections in there. So it's important and a lesson Certainly a lesson learned on that one. Let's talk about uh, politics here. And I thank you for the uh, the article that you sent me, which came out a couple of months ago in The New Yorker. Great publication. Biden is the most pro-labor president since FDR. Will it matter in November? Well, it's not going to matter because he bowed out of the race. And I got to ask you, how do you feel? It it seems like (laughs) it seems like things changed overnight here. What's the mood in central Ohio about 
Kamala Harris now. Well, it did change overnight. And President Biden, like like you stated, like the article said, and like I've posted many times, by far and away the most pro-labor president in the history of our country. And I think that as we get down the road a little way, you know, it's tough to judge presidents when they're in office. But as they get down the road a little way, um, you know, history will, will, will show that he obviously is one of the most pro-union presidents, not only the CHIPS Act, but the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. You know, he promised and campaigned that the first thing he was going to do was he was going to pass an infrastructure bill, fix our aging infrastructure. He's done that. All the work that it's created and all the ancillary work that's created, you know, the Brent Spence Bridge, which is going to be a tremendous undertaking. He's just one of the projects that's came out of the Infrastructure Act. It's going to be awesome. It's going to help folks. But, you know, a lot of the people I talk to down here, people in labor, but also people in politics are incredibly excited about the resurgence of Kamala Harris uh, getting on the ballot. You know, a lot of people you talk to, um, you know, it wasn't Biden or it wasn't Trump. It was the fact that their only choice was two people that they felt were both too old to be in office. And, um, you know, Vice President Harris brings a new energy. She brings an intensity to the campaign. Uh, she's a tireless worker. You you can see that. She was in Georgia the other day, gave a great speech. Uh, she's breaking records, uh, raising money. You know, the first 24 hours after she made her announcement, she raised over $46 million. The first three days, she raised close to $100 million. Not only is that going to help her, but it's going to help down ballot races too. Ruben Gallego in Arizona, it's going to help Sherrod Brown get reelected here in Ohio. It's going to help John Tester in Montana. I just think it's amazing. And in only a week, it's showing in the polls. The Rust Belt strategy, the Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan that Biden did so well to get elected. And Vice President Harris is going to copy that strategy. You know, she immediately caught Trump in all the polls, and she's only one point behind in Wisconsin. Georgia's back in play now. North Carolina's back in play. Arizona's back in play. She had a better favorability rating with Latino voters than President Biden did. Nevada's back in play. So I think there's several paths to the White House for her to get elected. And I think our members are very excited, whereas Trump has very few paths. And, you know, outside of the social issues, you know, reproductive rights, freedom to choose, all that stuff, we have to remember that in President Trump's four years, you know, he promised infrastructure bill, never even attempted it. You know, he tried to derail our apprenticeship programs with the IRAPs, mm -hmm. you know, just a lot of bad stuff that was going on. So we got to make sure that we get Vice President Harris elected and that she continues the legacy of President Biden and these so many important programs that are creating jobs and opportunities for our members and their families continue on. And she, like Joe Biden, not afraid to say the word union. In fact, she walked a picket line. So, yeah, I get it. All right, Mr. Hager, we're going to leave it on that note. Dorsey Hager, Executive Secretary, Treasurer, Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council. You can follow them on X at Build Central OH. You take care. Stay safe. We'll talk to you next month. Okay, brother? You take care, too. And like we talked about offline, huge first win in that very important series last night. Orioles, Guardians, hopefully they'll keep up the momentum and the weekend will end strong and they'll continue to take the series. So have a great weekend, Flash. Looking forward to talking to you in a month. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Fred Redman, Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO. This is America's Workforce. It takes Lyuna to build North America's infrastructure. From roads and bridges to schools and skyscrapers, the men and women of Lyuna, the Laborers International Union of North America, build the projects we depend on. From constructing the Freedom Tower on the site of the former World Trade Center to untangling Washington, D.C.'s congested interstate, Lyuna members do the work that matters. Find out what it takes to be built by Lyuna at lyuna.org. That's L-I-U-N-A dot org. America's Workforce is brought to you in part by the Heat and Frost Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust. Find out more at insulators.org forward slash LMCT. Attention members of the Heat and Frost Insulators Union who are interested in traveling. Central Ohio has more construction projects on the books than anywhere in the U.S. Mega projects, large and medium-sized jobs are creating more work than our local 50 brothers and sisters can handle. Projects like Intel, the Honda LG battery plant, 
and multiple data centers for Facebook, Google, and Amazon offer union wages, overtime, and exciting incentives. Local 50 is seeking union travelers to meet the needs of its signatory contractors who can put you to work immediately. If you're a member in good standing and interested in the work opportunities in Central Ohio, visit insulators50.com forward slash AWF travel for more information. The Alliance for American Manufacturing is a nonprofit, nonpartisan partnership formed back in 2007 by some of America's leading manufacturers and the United Steelworkers. Their mission is simple strengthen American manufacturing and create new private sector jobs through smart public policies. Key word there is smart. We need to be smarter than ever in today's highly competitive world. The Alliance for American Manufacturing believes that an innovative and growing manufacturing base is vital to America's economic and national security, as well as providing good jobs for future generations. Good jobs today, good jobs tomorrow. Good American jobs. Find out more at AmericanManufacturing.org. America's Workforce appreciates our sponsor, the Columbus Central Ohio Building and Construction Trades Council, who represents more than 18,000 workers from 19 affiliated local unions and district councils. This portion of the show is brought to you by Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield, labor's trusted health partner, bringing people, communities, and care together to transform the future of health. For more information, please visit anthem.com slash labor and trust. America's Workforce is sponsored in part by Boyd Watterson Asset Management, LLC. Find out more about our investment solutions tailored to meet the needs of Taft-Hartley funds at boydwatterson.com. This is America's Workforce. More shows available at awfradio.com. And remember, you can check us out on Facebook or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. That would be AWF Union Podcast. By the way, this next segment brought to you in part by the North Coast Labor Federation. Let's go to line number two. It's our first Friday with Fred. Fred Redmond, Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO, and he's going to talk about politics here. Fred, I want to talk about Kamala Harris, and you were telling me before we started the uh, podcast today that uh, you didn't you didn't get a chance to meet her sure. until she became vice president. And uh, Fred, let's be honest, you and I are both seasoned. Okay, we've been around the block a long time, and right. you know, a- after a certain point in life, you know how to judge people, you know how to read people, you know, and if that if you feel good about a person, you usually you usually know that right away. Take me back to that time because you know. Everything exploded here when uh, when President Biden said he wasn't going to run for reelection and she just came out of the gate. But you saw her at a different time. Would you take me back to that time, Fred? Well, thanks, Flash. The, the, the first time that I met Vice President Harris was in one of the earlier policy meetings when we were discussing the framework behind the infrastructure bill. And, you know, she really impressed me with her knowledge of Davis Baking Project Labor Agreements and her understanding of the labor movement. And I was impressed in that particular meeting with her knowledge in terms of what we do as a labor organization and the importance of Davis Bacon and the importance of uh, this infrastructure bill having provisions in it to promote um, good jobs, union jobs and uh, making sure that we have project labor agreements. And since that time, I've worked with her or staff on different uh, pieces of legislation. And I must say my first instinct was is that, first of all, she was a person of character, uh, conviction. Uh, she's no nonsense. She goes straight to the point, she has no problem expressing her feelings. And then I do know that she was behind making sure that the legislation that has made this the most pro-union administration in our history, she was behind uh, really pushing this legislation up on Capitol Hill. Now, a lot of our affiliate unions at the FLCO have worked with her and the proof of her character, the day after Biden had announced his retirement that he was going to step down, our president, Leah Shuler, convened an emergency executive council meeting to quickly endorse her. 
And she passed through that meeting. I mean, it was unanimous amongst the AFL-CIO. It was the quickest endorsement we've ever done. And, you know, Flash, if we go back and look at history, the labor movement was divided over uh, whether or not 1972 was going to endorse McGovern. Mm -hmm. Uh, 2008, we were divided over the endorsement of uh, President Obama. But within 24 hours, the labor movement was able to rally around Liz Shuler, uh, thanks to her and her working the phones and talking to people. We were able to endorse Vice President Harris within 24 hours after the Biden announcement. And that's a testament to her, the uh, trust and the conviction that uh, organized labor have in her carrying out the Biden agenda. And, um, you know, that that same day that Biden had announced his uh, uh, retirement that he was going to step down, uh, she called President Shuler that afternoon and made a strong commitment to carry the Biden agenda. And she assured us that she wanted to follow Biden and be one of the most pro-union presidents in the history of this country. And she assured us that she will appoint people who we have worked with in the past, people we have confidence in, and more importantly, we will be part of that process. So, look, I am impressed by Vice President Harris. I think her commitment to working people is real, you know, and uh, she uh, respect the way that we rallied behind President Biden. We supported his policies. And we assure her that we will do the same thing for her as long as she keep working families first. And she assured us that that will be the hallmark of her agenda. So, look, I'm very impressed. I'm very comfortable with her being the president of the United States that I know under her leadership as president. The Biden agenda of putting working families first will continue. That is pretty cool that she called Liz Shuler, one of the first people that she called. And that speaks a lot. And, you know, I was talking to the uh, the Central Ohio Building Trades, and you know what really speaks volumes? Right. She's not afraid to say the word, just like Joe Biden. She's not afraid to say the word union. Yeah. And she walked a picket line. She was there. Absolutely. With union brothers and sisters. She was on the ground floor. She she cares about workers. I like that. Yeah. Flash, I do want to say she walked the picket line with the UAW in 2019. Okay, before President Biden walked the pickle out with the UAW, she was out there in 2019. There wasn't a lot of media coverage. This was before she was vice president, when she was a senator. Uh In 2019, she took the time out of her schedule to stand with the UAW, and uh, we'll never forget that. Yeah, the UAW, in fact, uh, announced her. This was uh, two days ago because they were holding out a little bit. They wanted to see what was going on. Right. Sean Fain, I tell you, Sean, you know Sean Fain is a fighter. This is what he said. Our job in this election is to defeat Donald Trump and elect Kamala Harris to build on her proven track record of delivering for the working class. We can put a billionaire back in office who stands against everything our union stands for, or we can elect Kamala Harris, who will stand shoulder to shoulder with us in our war on corporate greed. This campaign is bringing together people from all walks of life, building a movement that can defeat Donald Trump at the ballot box. Fred, I have to ask, I don't think there's ever been two candidates more contrasting than what we have today. What's what's your take on that? No, absolutely. We have a candidate. And look, uh, uh, President Fain's statement is right on. Uh, you know, we have two candidates. One of them have bowed and committed and have proven that she will stand with working people. And as Sean Fain stated, you know, the other have proven to be a person who first priority is the billionaire class, uh, the corporate CEOs, and um, the uh, differences in the two candidates is clear. And organized labor is throwing its full weight behind Kamala Harris because we're convinced and we know that she's going to stand with working families. So, look, the uh, candidates isn't uh, even close in terms of their commitment to our working families. The organized labor is all in. Let's talk about uh, this point from today. 
August 2nd until November 5th, which is 90-plus uh, days away. A lot has to be done. you got to raise money. There are various states have uh, ballot issues that's going to draw out either um, Republicans or Democrats. I'm just wondering, the AFL-CIO, there's one thing, and I've said this so many times on the show, one thing that uh, labor has, workers have, boots on the ground, mm-hmm. getting out the vote. And, and getting, getting out the vote is so darn important. Right. There's going to be a lot of money spent on this campaign to more or less confuse voters and, and to be nasty and negative. It happens all the time. It's already happening. Let's be honest about that. Right. But getting, getting people, number one, registered to vote, and actually voting. And, and you know, in the last couple of years, some of these states have clamped down on voting. You know that, Fred. Right. So what's the game plan moving forward? Well, we're going to stick to the issues. Uh, we're going to have the largest ground game in the history of the AFL-CIO. We will be putting record numbers of boots on the ground. We will be making record number of phone calls to our members. We will be distributing record numbers of literature, comparing the contrast between the two candidates, and we feel a strong commitment, but more important, an obligation to define to our members where these two candidates stand on issues that's important to working families. Uh, We're going to talk because, look, Donald Trump's plan is already published. It's out in the public. It's called Project 2025, and I invite your listeners to go to the AFL-CIO website, AFL-CIO slash Project 2025. And we have a very comprehensive website where if you want to know what the plans of the Republican parties are regarding Social Security and Medicare, there's links for every subject that's contained in this 920-page document. And we're going to use that document to define the positions of this president, 120 of his colleagues contributed to constructing this document with the Heritage Foundation. His vice president wrote the forward of the document. And we're going to draw the contrast between their plan and the plan of Kamala Harris to stand up for working families. So our plan is to stick to the issues, educate our members on what these candidates stand for, that there's a difference in these two candidates And then our job is to make sure that they get out to the polls and vote. Boy, if there's one thing I can say about Project 2025, and Fred, you know there's there's a lot of union brothers and sisters that vote Republican, traditionally vote Republican, and they're going to vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. And if this happens, he says it's not going to happen, but (laughs) do you really believe that? J.D. Vance is pushing it, though. No, he's tired of this. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, if you're a union brother or sister listening right now, you may not have a union if Project 2025 is actually uh, implemented. That is the case. And you know what? To your point, you got to go to, there's so much posted. I mean, if you Google Project 2025, you'll find a lot of information. But I want to drive everybody to the AFL-CIO website, aflcio.org. It's right on the homepage over there. Right. And I mean, a lot of people are not going to read the 920 pages, let's be honest. But you pretty much took a look at the, the labor components, and they're ugly. They're really, really uh, end of project labor agreements for one. That's a biggie. Right. And, and pretty much national right to work. You know, right to work is in 20 plus states right now. It'll be in 50 states if this is implemented. It's pretty scary stuff, and we're going to stay on this issue. So thanks for calling it out. And uh, I'll tell you, that's one thing about politics. <laughs> it can change on a dime. There's no question about that. No doubt about that. Absolutely. So, Fred, I thank you for your input. I thank you for your dedication. I thank the AFL-CIO for the support of America's workforce. So you keep up the fight, my brother, and we'll talk to you in a month, okay? Okay. And let me just close with this, Flash. I'm going to quote a good friend of mine, James Carfield. A union member voting for Trump is like a chicken voting for Colonel Sanders. (laughs) We've got to get our members to understand what's at stake in this election. So thank you, Flash. I love it. Okay, buddy, you take care. Fred Redmond, Secretary Treasurer of the AFL-CIO. That'll be it for another edition of America's Workforce. Coming up on Monday, the Labor and Trust Division of Anthem, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield. Until then, all of you have a safe and wonderful weekend. 
That concludes another episode of the America's Workforce Radio Podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. America's Workforce is a production of Labor Tools and BMA Media Group. Find out more information online at labortools.com.